Well, um, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but as far as I understand it, you can, like, in Storm, you have the um, transactional topologies and the exactly one semantic. So it's guaranteed that you're not going to lose any of the input data when you process it. So because of this, you have a pretty good accuracy. Uh, you know, you cannot really lose any input data. Um, I'm not really sure if that this is what answers your question. Maybe we should take it, uh, like talk about this after the presentation. Okay, because it will be probably bigger discussion. Reservoir sampling. I just wanted to know what is the intuition behind it, uh, the way you explain the reservoir sampling. Why, I mean, what's the intuition to have that kind of sampling model in place when there are multiple sampling models available? Okay. And the second one is about, you talked about STORM and R integration. Uh, <clears throat> less about R, but more about uh, how, of, in your uh, experience, how often you retrain the models and retraining and deploying models, comparing the models with the one which is the working best. How does that work? Uh, how did you implement that? It's, it really de depends on the use case in my experience. Um, just actually, it's, it's very interesting that you ask about this because just last week I was working on the project that uh, I implemented first as a dynamic model, meaning the, you know, the data, the model was constantly updated as the new data arrived. And it turns out that the business user actually didn't want it. They preferred the static model because it was more reliable. You know, they were always able to somehow replicate the data and see using the same model and see, you know, check the numbers. So from my experience, it really depends. Like sometimes um, it's definitely useful, I would think, to have a dynamic model because you can react to the new data as it's changing. Uh, but quite often, as you can see, you know, the business users actually prefer to have something more reliable and you know, static. But it's definitely, what I see is um, there are many new startups which are focusing on the online machine learning, uh, where you can dynamically create the machine learning algorithms and keep updating them as the new data is streaming. So um, there's definitely quite a lot of research going into this area, and um, I think it's an it's a area worth focusing on. Can you remind me of your first question? So it was yeah. about the... Because about the sampling Oh, yes, yeah, reservoir sampling. So with the reservoir sampling, the, the intuition is that if you have a, a data in your database, you know exactly how much data you have. So you, if you want to create a sample, it's very simple because you know that you need to sample every 100 element, every 1,000 element, and so on. With the data streaming, the idea is that you don't know the size of the input data. So you have to somehow implement a slightly different algorithm to create your sample. So this is where the reservoir sample intuition is basically coming from. So in this case, the algorithm is very, very simple. In, this, in the first step, you simply take, you know, if you want to create a sample of 1,000, you simply take first 1,000 elements, and then you keep, uh, you know, with some probability, you keep replacing some of them. Um, yeah, but that's, that's essentially the intuition. Well, actually, no. That's, that's the beauty of the reservoir sampling. I would recommend looking into one of those uh, papers um, that I put the reference to. Uh, it turns out that the statistical properties of the samples created using the reservoir sample are very, very good. All right, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you very much, Radek, uh, for that wonderful presentation. Thank yours. you very much. And uh, belongs to you. Thank you. Am I going to get the same certificate again? I thought I would get the second one. No, this, this, <laughs> this is it. Anyway, right. but thank you. Thank Appreciate you very much. it. Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, moving on, we're going to have a joint presentation uh, in the technology track, which is uh, going to be uh, <coughs> you know, shared by three speakers uh, one from Blob City, uh, one from Druva.com, 
and uh, of course in fact you have two speakers from blob city so i think uh, you know you can probably just uh, give a topic uh, you Absolutely. know just about what you're going to cover and perhaps take it forward from here yeah sure. thank you so everyone can hear me okay so uh, i tell you what the session is about the session is about you know discussing a new and upcoming database which is uh, infinitum and it's we'll be covering features of what we offer along with uh, some case studies in the industry where we have implemented this and how how you can handle high velocity variety and volume of data at real time uh, using a product like ours so there'll be a total of three speakers in this uh, uh, one of them is Akshay Nair who does business development for us uh, myself I'm founder of Blob City and I'll be talking more about uh, some of the case studies that we have done implementations and uh, some hands-on session on the product. And then we have one of our customers, uh, Mr. Arun Uday, uh, who will be talking about what we or what Infinitum has done for him for his product. Okay. So that's the basic agenda. Is big data in a nutshell, Infinitum database features and benefits, uh, a demo of the product, some case studies, uh, you know, the total cost of ownership and licensing, how does it work, and uh, case study talk, which is uh, truer.com, uh, which is the search engine that will be described. So I'll hand it over quickly to Akshay for some time to uh, take you through, to, to basically create a background on where our system falls and what category it falls. And from there, I'll move to what the product is. Yeah, thank you, Sanket. Yeah, good afternoon, people. This is Akshay from Blob City. So what I'll be basically covering over here is I'll be giving you a basic overview of how the, the database system is actually transitioned from the traditional RDBMS to the big data system. And today, which is actually going to a new, new implementation level, which is called a new I SQL. I don't know that. Okay. So I'll begin off with this. So what is the first thing when you talk about big data? What is the first thing that actually don't comes to your mind? Don't give what are the things? What is the first word that comes to your mind, basically? Don't give it on stage. So you have the you have the, the basic words that come to your mind: distributed scalability, volume, high high amounts of da, high amounts of data, velocity, data flowing in a real time, variety, different kinds of data, structured, unstructured, semi-structured data. Then you have this: you have different kinds of analytics, which comes to your picture, which comes to your mind, basically like descriptive analytics, sentimental analytics, mm -hmm. predictive analytics. You mm -hmm. have fancy graphs, yeah. visualization yeah. tools, which helps you basically yeah. analyze what kind of data and pro provide insights yeah. on it. So is this, is this what's really, so what is actually big data? If supposedly I have to ask yeah, you people, it up. whether you had to describe big data in one line, mm -hmm. how will you guys possibly do that? Mm -hmm. So this is the classical definition which is actually taken from Wikipedia. And this actually suits, this is actually one of the best sort of definition. Big data is a collection of data sets so large and complex that it becomes difficult to process using traditional data management tools. So what is it that we talk about traditional, what is the traditional data management tools? So the traditional data management tools which we talk about here is called a relational database management system, RDBMSs. Some systems that you may have heard of, some popular systems that you might have heard of is MySQL, Oracle, MS SQL, et cetera. Okay. So this RDBMS system, they have been basically, they have been, a, they have been a part of the IT infrastructure since the past 45 years, since its inception in 1970 where it was first founded by IBM. Okay. Yeah, so it has been a part of the system recently, but what happens in the recent year, what happened is once the, as the data size started to increase in the, re in the, re in the recent years with the, in, with the advent of internet, with the advent of technology, basically customers started going online. So there's a lot of data that was created by the, by the industries. So data actually increased in volume there are different kinds of data that start coming to picture. Structured data, unstructured data, social feeds, sensor data, machine data, etc. So what businesses actually found out that they need to tap into this form of data to actually provide better customer, ins better customer insights and better operational efficiencies. But there was a catch over here. What happened was that this relation system, which was the actual backend, which was a backend infrastructure, was suitable for, for, suitable for performance Basically, when the data size were pretty fixed, when the, when the data size was uh, when the data when the data size was small, 
and it was in a pretty relational format. Relational systems were able to handle this amount of quantity. But as the data size started to increase, there were certain challenges that relational systems actually began to face. So these are some of the challenges of the RDBMS. The first one is scalability. So RDBMS are a, are a brilliant system. They are robust, scalable, they are a robust system, they are a fault tolerant system, they are a very secure system, basically. But what we actually noticed was that once the data size began to increase, there was a drop in the performance of the server. Then comes fixed schemas. So relational systems, relational systems they basically they form they form relations between different data sets. And they are used for and they are used for basically for defined defined structures. You need to actually define your data when you're actually uh, the same, storing it in a database. But with the advent of technology like social media and all those stuff, when companies wanted to analyze this data, they found out that they couldn't actually they couldn't actually define they couldn't actually define relations between these different uh, social the social media data and etc. So that is one of the again problems that uh, the RDMS faces. Second one is continuous availability. It's like most of the system they actually store, they actually stored on a single node, the single format. So suppose there's a, there's a certain power outage, a certain data fa data node failure. The complete uh, there's, there's a complete uh, this thing. There's a complete system downtime which occurs over there. And again, a classical this thing handling analytical workloads. Since relation so relation systems are in a row row based storage. It's classically said that it's not suitable for analytical workloads because analytics actually requires you to query through columns and etc. So what about these challenges? So like if you, these challenges are obviously prevalent and everybody actually has a, has a knowledge about this. Everybody knows that these are the challenges that RDBMS faces right now. So what do you do? You actually just, just do you just migrate to a system, a big data system exactly. There's not a need for it basically. You you can you can uh, scalability scalability can be arranged for by uh, by by adding uh, this thing what is it by adding a very high performing server. You don't need to actually change. You don't need to actually go for this thing. Uh, continuous availability, like nowadays there are sharding there are sharding technologies that are coming in this thing. So RDBMS can be sharded across different nodes. So even if one node goes down, you don't need to actually you don't need, there's no compromise on the availability and there's actually there's no down, downtime. Handling analytical workloads. Yes, absolutely. Analytics can be handled. Analytics can be done by a relational system. You can get a very good developer. You can get a very good database administrator who can sit and find good queries and do your analytic workload. This. Then, what is the basic What is the basic challenge? Why are we actually looking at a big data system? Why are, Why is a picture of big data coming into a, Why is big data coming into picture right now over here? The basic thing is cost effectiveness and ease of implementation. This is something that a big data system actually provides for. A big data system needs to be cost effective and it should be easy to implement and manage. Adding, like the, uh, the things that I said before, like adding a high configuration server, adding, uh, uh, this adding, a, uh, adding a replication node, adding a replication sharding uh, technologies into between, those are like pretty high, those are, those are pretty expensive right now. And ma maintaining and managing the systems are pretty tough. So that's what something that a big data system should actually aggregate for. That is cost effectiveness, adopt adoptability of the system, and ease of management of the system. So with this basically came the Hadoop and the NoSQL system. So the Hadoop and NoSQL system they actually start they actually gave the they actually gave developers and the business to run their tech to run technology on commodity hardware. So, they, uh, so you can actually, and they give they give features like massive parallel processing and distributed scalability. So you can actually distribute your data. You can actually distribute your data amongst different. You can diff among different among many server many servers in a cluster. Okay. So just basically, so it's like there's no compromise on the scalability. So it's like if there's a performance issue, you just need to scale up your system, and that's and your perform and the scalability issues are solved for. High availability. <laughs> Data is distributed. Data is actually distributed in a, in a, in a system like NoSQL and Hadoop system. So even if one node fails, even if one node fails because of any server complications or any server failures or anything, your data is still backed up and you still have a copy of the system and your system never goes down basically. You can, you see, your system can just revive itself and come back online. Flexible data models. One of the major things which Hadoop and NoSQL actually provided for 
they are given you the ability to process both structured as well as unstructured data. So, so you can actually handle you can actually handle both structured data like transactional data, operational data. You can handle even unstructured data like Twitter feeds, social media, web logs, etc. And they are the best system. They are one of the best systems for running complex and high-speed analytics. But there's a particular but. Okay, so these are one of the best systems. So these are one of the best systems which you can actually think of when it comes to analytic per analytic performances and all. But there's a thing. There's a there's a particular. But I want to actually share one of the market stats which I just found. So this is a basic IDC report which I found. This states that in the present year for twenty for 2014, 84 percent 84 percent of the database market is still comprised of the RDBMS system. Only 16 percent. Only 16 percent of the market is comprised of NoSQL databases. So, what is that? What is the major challenge that we're actually facing over here? So, the major thing over here is still the operational part of the data. So it's like because relational systems are one of the most one of the most fantastic systems for uh, operational purposes. Moving from a, moving from a relational system to something like Hadoop and NoSQL because the relation system fails in terms of scalability, data flexibility, and availability. This is one of the most important parts. So what's, what are the major challenges that are non relation systems such as Hadoop and NoSQL faces during when they, have, when, they have been, when they have to be implemented for operations? NoSQL compliance, one of the most important points. Hadoop and MongoDB, MongoDB, no SQL systems like MongoDB, Cassandra, etc. They have their own query mechanism. They have their own query infrastructure mechanisms and everything. So what happens over here? What is the main challenge that we call or enterprise faces over here? Is that they need to enter, they, if they have to adopt a system from a, they have to migrate a system from a relation from a relation database to a system like no SQL to a no SQL system. They need to actually change the entire backend infrastructure. They need to actually change the backend code. They need to change the frontend part of it. The frontend is comp the frontend code has to be changed because of lack of SQL compliance. Compromise on asset. RDBMS is typical. RDBMS is very famous for its asset compliance. It has the mo it has it has hundred percent asset the thing. So it's it's one of the best systems for operational performance. No SQL systems and Hadoop systems haven't yet matured to the level where they can provide full asset compliance. So that's one of the other challenges. Other th other challenges can be the ability, the lack of stored lack of ability to store stored procedures and etc. So you need to actually you need to actually change your business logic when you're actually shifting from a relation system to a big data system, big data system like No SQL. Data integrity again. Data integrity is basically comparable because there's a compromise on asset properties over here. Migration again. Migration is a huge task over here. It's a huge challenge over here because again, your system is it requires a complete code. It requires a complete change of code and etc. So at present, at present we do not have this. There's a system. We have the RDBMS system, which is one of the most famous systems for operational performance, operational workloads. And you have you have uh, systems like non like non related systems like NoSQL and Hadoop, Hadoop, which is very famous for analytical workloads basically. But still, but still, today's enterprises today today's enterprises actually requires a system which can handle both operation as well as analytics. So this is what we so this is what we at Blob City were planning to bridge the gap again. So we are planning to we have, we have built a system which is actually capable. Of bridging the gap between operational transa operation, transaction processing and analytic processing. So we're making a one and all system which can handle both transaction as well as analytical workloads. So this is actually the this is actually the advent of the new database called as new uh, the new in, uh, the new infrastructure which is called a new SQL. So what are the features of a new SQL database? We store data in a relational data format. There's no compromise on that. So you have you can still you can still define relation between your systems and all by, uh, because you store it in a table in a tablet in a tabular format basically. SQL compliant, 100% SQL compliant. Hence you don't have to compromise on the ease the basically the ease of migration 
from your application of your application from a relation system to a system like this a new sql system is pretty smooth rather than rather than having major code changes distributed scalability now we come to the no sql feature so what is basic so what is basically a new sql system is that is basically a relational system plus the features of a no sql system features of a no sql system like distributed scalability dynamic schema data distribution and high availability so we address the challenges of a relation system with a relation system such as scalability so we actually so instead of vertically scaling a system by adding by instead of adding more and more server configurations to this thing we can just add servers in parallel like something like a hadoop and a no sql system will do dynamic schema we can handle all kinds of data structured unstructured as well as semi structured data data distribution and high availability data is data is replicated around different nodes so there's no there's no way that data will be uh, there's no way that even if it, so there's no compromise on the downtime basically so data so data is always available so even if one node fails you have another node which actually balances for it okay what are some what are some benefits of moving from a from a system from a rdbms system to a new sql system is handle massive and complex data sets in real time something that no sql system provides for near real time data processing zero downtime again because of data distribution on different node transaction plus analytic processing this is one thing that new sql is actually famous for so you can you can run both transaction with 100% asset compliance and everything with analytics sql compliance again 100% sql a new sql system is always 100% sql so there's no shift from there's no shift in the thing no changes in the front end of the application so your application can seamlessly connect with our back end with our back end infrastructure because sql compliance developer and administrator skill set so most of the developers and administrators they actually they actually they are uh, set on the on sql on uh, the sql systems they have uh, they don't they don't have much of a they don't much of a learning curve to learn from a, to actually move from a sql system to a no sql we need to actually learn the no sql query mechanism and etc migration effort again migration effort is pretty smooth over here because of the because of this data integrity 100% asset compliance hence one so data integrity is pretty is not the integrity of data is not compromised cost effectiveness again since we actually do not need we do not need 